It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray. Where will you hear worship he hears?
Good morning, Revival Today Church, Pittsburgh. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Then make welcome our Fort Worth campus. That's where Pastor Jonathan is going to be preaching from today. He's on his way. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's on his way. Mm -hmm. Why don't you lift up your hands? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your wonderful presence in this place. I thank you for your anointing that destroys the heavy yoke of bondage. And whatever bondage is represented here tonight or today, I thank you, Father, for breaking it down into teeny tiny little pieces. Every burden, everything of heaviness, everything of chaos and defeat and failure. Father, I thank you that in this anointing, you make it all disappear in the mighty name of Jesus. And in its stead, we thank you for faith to come alive on every, in every person and for the love and joy and peace of heaven to come upon every person here in the mighty name of Jesus. If you receive that, say amen. And I want you to turn around and greet your neighbor, give him a high five and say, you look snazzy. You may be seated. How many of you guys, this is the first time you have stepped foot in Revival Today Church? I want to see a hand. Okay, all right. Let's start over here. We've got you that's the closest. Where are you guys from? You already put your hand up, okay? So you're going to have to tell me where you're from. Where are you from? Indiana. Say welcome, Indiana. I said say welcome, Indiana. Thank you. We're kind people here in Indiana. Anybody else over here? No, no, first time. Where are you from? Bucks County. Where's that? Oh, Philly, Philly area. Wow. Say welcome, Bucks County. Wow. Where are you from, sir? Indianapolis. Say welcome, Indianapolis. Where are you from, ma'am? Pittsburgh, PA, you know what to do. Turn around and say, where you been? Yo. Who over here? Anybody over here? Anybody over here? Anybody over here? Anybody over here? Sir, where you from? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Turn around, tell them. Where you been, bro? Where you been? And then please stand up on your feet, you and your lovely wife. Uh, these are our newest RTC members, y'all. Why don't you give it up for them? Do you know where they're traveling from and where they're going to continue to travel from? New Hampshire. Like, are you kidding me? And we're complaining about a 30 minute drive. They're from New Hampshire. How long is that drive? 10? 15. Oh, with kids. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say I could do that at nine. <laughs> uh, I'm so happy you guys are here. Let's play the announcements. Guys, go ahead. 
Good morning, Revival Today Church. Here are your weekly announcements. We will be having Easter choir rehearsal right after service at 107 Patton Drive. Pittsburgh Easter Fest Saturday is happening here March 30th at 10 a.m. We're going to have over 20,000 Easter eggs, bounce house, face paint. You don't want to miss it for your kids and your family. And then join us for our big Pittsburgh Easter Sunday service at 10 a.m. Invite everyone that you know. There is Operation Andrew cards on your chair, and you can think of seven people that you would like to invite for Easter. And in Fort Worth, we are having an Easter blowout weekend with evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth. He will be preaching the whole weekend, Friday at 7 p.m., Saturday at 7 p.m., and then Sunday at 9 a.m. for the main event. There will also be an Easter egg hunt happening Saturday at the outreach at 11 a.m. Pittsburgh, next week is our spiritual emphasis service. We have Friday, our miracle service happening at 7 p.m., and then we have Saturday, our communion service that's happening at 6 p.m. And obviously, don't miss Sunday, our main event at Revival Today Church. For all of these events, please register at rtcregister.com. Revival Today Bible Institute is now accepting applications for 2024 and 2025. If you're interested in applying, please visit revivaltodaybibleinstitute.com. And that's all for your weekly announcements. I will see you next week, Revival Today Church. Hallelujah. Can you say hallelujah? Okay, so how many of you guys have the Operation Andrew card? I want you to lift it up over your head. This is very, very important. As Revival Today Church, we want to go into uh, the world and, and, and reach those individuals. And this is a way um, that we feel is the best way in reaching out those um, that need Jesus. There are seven individuals that we want you to prayerfully consider inviting to the Easter event. Seven people. You all know seven people, whether it's your mailman or a co-worker or a couple of family members. I want you to do your part and invite them to Easter service. Can you say amen? This is a soul winning church. We don't just sit and look pretty and clock in. We go out and reach the lost. Can you say amen? amen? And so I want to encourage you. I can't believe. Is Easter this Sunday? Okay, that's wonderful. So Easter is this Sunday. When is it? This Sunday. It came in quick. It came in very early. And again, I want to reemphasize the fact that we are doing an outreach on that Saturday. At what time, Pastor Sampson? 10 a.m. Okay, so 10 a.m. I want you to be a part of that and um, just just uh, really enjoy time with your family here, your actual family and the, the church here in Pittsburgh. All right, are you ready to sow seed this morning? Jonathan is coming, um, and you're going to see him in just a couple of minutes. But I want you to turn to Psalm 107. And once you're there, say amen. I was thinking a lot. I do. I, I think a lot, right? So I'm like always kind of like in my head or whatever. But I was just thinking about uh, the state of gratitude. And so how many of you guys were here on Wednesday for um, Adam Lamb? He's a, he's a business guy and he leads RTX. If you're in business or an entrepreneur and you want to kind of get connected with the business people in the house of God, I really encourage you to connect uh, with RTX because it is an awesome opportunity for you to grow and get around people that are in businesses and also growing entrepreneurs and and uh, great like big thinkers. You want to get around people who think bigger than you. And Brother Adam really is a big thinker. So we were uh, he was talking about a lot of things on Wednesday, but one of the things was uh, writing a list of a hundred things that you're grateful for. A hundred, not three, not one, a hundred things that you're grateful for. And so I began to write the list of things that I'm grateful for, and I just became inundated with love and compassion and just thankfulness to God. And I thought, I have to be in this state a lot more often. It, it, it just changes everything. When you're in an attitude where you are thankful 
life is so much easier. Life is so much more pleasing. And so I want you to see with your eyes what the Bible says about gratitude. Because listen, I've had lots of bad news like these last couple of weeks. And uh, it's enough to just make you want to give up and cry and sit in a corner and pout. You know, but there's no time for that. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's no time for that. No. Turn to your other neighbor and say, get over it respectfully. Get over it. I love you, but get over it. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, so anyway, uh, so I was just thinking a, a lot about those things. And, and this, this, this place of gratitude really is the, the determining factor for if you're going to stay in sulk or you're going to keep on moving, huh? Because a lot of times in life, things don't go as planned. <laughs> huh? They just, you wish that they were different, but they're not. And so what are you going to do? Are you going to cry about it? No, there's no time for that. But I can tell you that in this state, of gratitude, you have to continue to, to continually look at all the good that God has done in your life. That's a secret ingredient to success in this earthly realm. Because if you think about all the things that just didn't pan out and how unfair everything was and blah, 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 you're just, you're not going to move anywhere. You'll just sit there and sulk and that's exactly where the enemy wants you to be. Sitting down, not moving, not taking over, not being in faith, just sitting there crying. And you know what I'm going to say, right? There's no time for that. So Psalm, 17, uh, Psalm 107 says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. You know, when we give thanks, it has nothing to do with your circumstances. I said, when you give thanks, it has nothing to do with your circumstances. And I'm telling you, North America, you've got it all wrong because a lot of times we are trained to give thanks when something good happens. But that's simply not what the word of God says. It says give thanks simply because his faithful love endures forever. And he is good. He is good yesterday. He is good right in the present situation that you're in. And he's going to be good forever. Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Yeah, that never changes. God never changes. Our circumstances and our emotions might change. We, uh, we keep going up and down, but God is the constant. He is still the same, and he will remain faithful forever. Can you say amen? Verse 2, has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. You know, that's one of the reasons why we are a soul winning church. It's not good enough for you to just sit there and take all, all of this goodness in and just keep it to yourself. The Bible says if God has been good to you, if he's redeemed you, then speak it out. And you know, I'm shy. Does it? I'm not buying that because I was shy. I was so shy that I could not pick up a mic and say hello. I could not go. When I was in high school and there was an oral presentation for the class, I'd call in sick. And if I had to go in on Saturday evening, that's exactly what I was going to go into because we had a, a big school. And so if you had to make up work, it would be on Saturday. I'm like, happily, just as long as nobody's looking at me. If there was more than two people, I would just like, you know, just cry. But the Bible says that he hasn't given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That means that when he's commanded you to do something, which is go and tell the people that I exist, that I am good, that I am faithful, and that I've redeemed you. That's your job. He did it. He said it for you to do. He commanded for you to do, which means he also equipped you to do it. So if it was about you being timid, then he wouldn't have said it, right? Well, some people are just shy and some people are more boisterous. Jonathan is so bold. I wish I could be bold like him. Well, he has the Holy Ghost living on the inside of him and so do you. 
so you can be bold too and preach the gospel to everyone everywhere. I find it very interesting that that great commission was never for one or two individuals in the body of Christ. It was everyone. Say me. Yeah, you have a part to play in reaching the lost. Verse 3. For he has gathered the exiles from many lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in the wilderness, lost and homeless. You might be able to relate to these things that I'm about to tell you right now. Because it's going to get heavy here. But I want you to see. Because sometimes we just forget. In the mundane life that we live, the, the just routine, we might forget about how faithful and good God really is. And it says, some of you have cried, Lord, help. And he rescued them from their distress. He led them straight to safety, to a city where they could live. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for, him, for them. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Say good things. Some sat in darkness and deepest gloom. Huh? Has anybody been delivered from anxiety or depression or oppression? Say hey. Imprisoned in iron chains of misery. I mean, he's, he's trying to paint a picture for you here. They rebelled against the words of God. How many of you guys have rebelled against the words of God? Just two of you. You ain't being real, because I know I have. Scorning the counsel of the Most High. That's why he broke them with hard labor. They fell and no one was there to help them. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble. And he saved them from their distress. He led them from the darkness and deepest gloom. He snapped their chains. Let, let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. For he broke down the, their prison gates of bronze. He cut apart their bars of iron. Some were fools. They rebelled and suffered for their sins. They couldn't stand the thought of food and they were knocking at death's door. How many of you guys could relate to that? Man, I, I'm relating to every single one of these. <laughs> every last one of these. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, snatching them from the doors of death. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and sing joyfully about his glorious acts. Can you say hallelujah? Yes, there is a place that we have to remain. Somebody is crying hard back there. There is a place, an attitude that we have to stay in, and that is the attitude of thankfulness. If you want to be an entitled little brat in the eyes of God, continue to live your life apart from him and be overcome with the day-to-day -day issues and your own little world and your own little finances. That's, that's, that's ultimately what we're trained to do. Just as long as I have enough for me and my house, I'll be good, pastor. That is the lamest thing I have ever heard because that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that we have to go and clothe the naked. We have to feed the hungry. Do you know what that means? We have to have access. Say access. Extra. Say extra. extra. Yeah. You have to train yourself to live in the overabundance. And it's not just to buy nice shoes or a nice comfy home. It's about reaching the lost. It's about the, the heartbeat of heaven, which is winning the lost. You know, you have an opportunity to make God's dream come true. Do you even know that God dreams? Do you even know that God has a desire? You think he has it all? No, he doesn't. He wants you if you've never been saved. And he wants a, a, a world that's lost and dying. And we have the opportunity to make his dream come true. 
But what happens? We get inundated. Just marriage is really difficult right now because it's just, I don't even think we're like on the same page. And then you're stuck in that for 15, 20 years. Turn to your neighbor and say, get over it. Say, with all due respect. That's what I say when I say something rude. <laughs> with all due respect. No, you know, whatever. But we get inundated with the day-to-day -day things, the business, the finances, and all that kind of stuff. And that's exactly, you know, most people remain ineffective. It's not because of sin. It's just because you are so busy about the cares of this world, about the cares of life. And, and if you change that up, if you begin to magnify God, magnify his works, and never forget where you came from, pride can't come in. Complacency can't come in. Stagnancy can't come in. Why? God wants to be remembered. We did last uh, service for Children's Church, uh, a service about communion. And I was like a little bit concerned about communion because it's a very high and holy thing. And I wanted to make sure that these kids weren't just eating it because they were, wanted a snack. Do you know what I'm saying? And so I was like, well, I was just kind of tossing up the idea. And I was quickened in my spirit that we have to have faith like who in order to enter a child, the faith of a child, right? So I thought, well, if we have to have the faith of a child, then when I tell them what this really is, is uh, means, then they'll be able to understand it. And my goodness, they understood it. I mean, they understood it, and it was such a powerful thing to see these little kids really put into remembrance what Christ did on the cross. But one of the things that I emphasized was that God wants to be remembered. How many of you guys from time to time will just write God a thank you letter? Thank you for, remember that one time? I'm driving in my car and sometimes I just think about all the things that have happened. And I, I think to myself, God, had it not been for your hand, I would have died. Had it not been that you intervened with angelic uh, help, I, I would have been kaput. That would have been a disaster. But your hand was upon my life and you helped me and you guided me through that darkness and despair. And look at where I am now. I can only say that I am where I am because of the grace of God. And I wish you would train yourself to be in that state. Whenever you're feeling funky, Think about the things that Christ has done for you and your family. And then all of a sudden, the funky doesn't matter. You know, that's not that bad. Because I do remember when I lost a third of my blood and I couldn't open my eyes in the, in the hospital. So whatever it is that you're going through, I want you to remain in that state of gratitude. But look at here. It says in verse 22, let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and sing joyfully about his glorious acts. Why do we have to give a seed of gratitude on Thanksgiving only? Turn to your neighbor and say, no, nope, I'm doing one today. I said, no, nope, I'm doing one today. I'm not waiting for Thanksgiving to say I'm thankful. Why? Why can't I be thankful every single day? And when you remain, and I encourage you, like Adam Lamb said, write a list of 100 things that you're thankful for. And, and by the time you're at, you know, 26, your eyes will be filled with tears because of the goodness of God. But why wait until Thanksgiving to sow a seed of gratitude? Why not just take this random Sunday before Easter Sunday just to thank God for doing what he has done in your life? Are you living? Are you breathing? Then it's enough to be thankful for. It's enough to thank God. The fact that you're sitting here listening to the words that I'm saying, able to use your hands, able to speak, able to blink your eyes and breathe, it's enough to give thanks to God can you say amen? amen so I want you to reflect that in your giving today church in Fort Worth I want you to do just the same and those that are watching I want you when you give today to, to, to give with an attitude of gratitude I want you to wrap that seed with just thank you 
Not even expecting anything, but you are going to, uh, uh, you know, that there's just the law of sowing and reaping. But just be in a state of gratitude. God, this is what I'm thankful for. Before you give it, I want you to close your eyes and just pray over that offering. And give thanks to God and say, Lord, you You saved my life so many times. You saved the lives of my children. You helped me find this church. This is a supernatural intervention. Thank you for helping me find this church. Thank you for helping me walk again. Thank you for joy once more. Thank you for peace again. Thank you for the light that you bring every single day of my life. Can you say amen? And that's what I want you to do. I want you to wrap your gratitude around that seed that you're going to give today. And guess what? doesn't matter what you're going through. Some of you guys are walking probably some of the toughest things you've ever walked through. But I've been there a time or two myself. And you just got to put one foot in front of the other and trust God. And in the process of all of this turmoil and madness and craziness, if you can stay in an attitude of gratitude, I'm telling you, you'll go further faster. Can you say amen? These are the ways to give. They're on the screen. You can give Cash App, Venmo, PayPal. You can text RT to 50155. You can even partner with the ministry. For those of you that are watching online, you want to partner with Revival Today, go to revivaltoday.com forward slash give, and you can uh, partner with us there. We're doing the most we've ever done. Jonathan is in Texas today. You're going to see in a little bit uh, the span of how much he's traveled just within the last eight days. It's insane. Uh, so partner up with, with uh, our mission, revivaltoday.com forward slash give. If you've got anything left in cryptocurrency, you could scan that card, uh, the QR code. And then if you don't want to do any of those things, you could send you, uh, a check made payable to Revival Today, P.O. Box 7, Prosperity, PA, 15329 and you church people if you need an envelope go ahead and raise your hands and an usher will get one to you quickly And then once you're ready, please stand up on your feet. And I want you to make welcome the pastor of this house, your pastor, my husband, Jonathan Shuttlesworth. Give it up. Give it up. For at least 20 seconds, give it up. Come on. And then once you're ready, stand up on your feet. And I want you to make welcome the pastor of this house, your pastor, my husband, Jonathan Shuttlesworth. Give it up. Give it up. For at least 20 seconds, give it up. Sir, as long as she doesn't know her mic's still up, that could end our ministry. A dollar. Okay, this is this will not be able to be done then. I love you, Dosh. If you if you start dressing like Beth Dutton, I'm not gonna let you watch Yellowstone anymore. I'm just thinking you're watching too many episodes because you look like it. I don't have a cowboy hat or cowboy boots. Good to see you in Pittsburgh across the street. I was just there this morning. And then uh, good to be with you in Texas. I'm gonna play you something that the Lord did before you're seated. We did um 
And then I had forgotten about this. Did they collect the offer? Okay, I just started Bastion two years ago, so cut me some slack. I see your judgmental eyes. Go ahead and receive the offer. While they're receiving it, I want to... I want, I want to show, show you what, what God, God did. did. Somebody, Somebody, I, I, I went, went to Vancouver, Vancouver British, British Columbia, Columbia which, which is, is like the, the San Francisco, Francisco of Canada, Canada. Like, like the, the, lib the, the most liberal, liberal part. part. And, and um, I, don't I don't think people, people do week-long evangelistic meetings, meetings there. there. So, so you, you actually get, get a better result, result because, because the people, people are extremely hungry. hungry. And uh, we went over. Somebody sent me a tweet that I had tweeted in 2021, which I must have just been praying. I wrote... I wrote, God, God just spoke, spoke to me out of the blue about, about holding a meeting in Vancouver, Vancouver British, British Columbia. Columbia. And, and I said, uh, uh, and I'm and not I'm getting, getting vaccinated, vaccinated so, so what does that tell you? And I wrote, over soon. soon. Because, because back, back then, then it was written permanently that nobody, that nobody would be allowed into Canada, Canada that wasn't vaccinated. vaccinated. So, so they let me know that everything was going to lift and I was going to go across. Well, that meeting had a divine feel. That's a new church that started during the lockdown. They have about 75 people on Sunday, Sunday mornings, mornings, which, which is, is great. great. It, would it would be way, way above average, average for British, British Columbia, Columbia and especially for a new church. church. We, we had 280 something, something to start on Sunday night. night. Then, then it grew every, every night, night to about 340. And then, and then on the last, last night, we had 505 people in a 325 seater. So the way the church started, you guys already received the offering? All right, you can be seated. So I can tell them I'm going to get rolling. This was pretty awesome. The lady, uh, there was a lady that was watching one of my Facebook or YouTube broadcasts. There's a, there's a lot of Iraqi and Iranian Christians in Vancouver that got run out of, of their countries. So she had that background, I think Catholic background, and she had made up her mind, married with four kids, that she was going to kill herself. Affluent, nice business. You know, plenty of money and everything, and she was done. She made sure that, that uh, their life insurance, her life insurance, that it covered suicide. She left all her passwords on a piece of paper for her husband and children. And uh, she was going to kill herself in December, but one of the kids had a birthday then, and she didn't want to do it then. Then another kid had a birth, uh, birthday in January, so she was going to wait till after that and do it in February. So she was so broken down that she, she was just looking on YouTube for anything, and some of you watched it. When I did that introduction to fasting and prayer from my, from my dining room table, just with my laptop, I've, that's the only broadcast I've ever done like that with a laptop because I, I felt quickened to do it then. That's the one she found. And then I said, I know this is a teaching on fasting for Christians, but just in case anybody's watching this that hasn't ever given their life to the Lord, and she gave her life to the Lord and then kept watching, went on the 21-day fast, and then the church... She started gathering other Iraqi family members and people from the area, and th that's how the church formed. They had about 25 or 30 meeting that were watching this church e every Sunday, and then my brother-in-law and sister, who pastor in Montreal, formally concreted it as a church, and so I got to meet her. She, so when you hear her on the testimony say, th this ministry saved my life, she's not using like Christian talk. She, she had made up her mind and organized it to kill herself, had already, had already made up her mind how she was going to do it. Then another guy that's a youth pastor in Montreal, he flew across and gave his testimony. Same thing. The last time I was preaching in Montreal, he had made up his mind. He's a successful chef. He was going to kill himself. And his friend called him out of the blue. His friend, who's a Christian, felt quickened to call him, Mike Copa, and said, whatever you're planning on doing right now, he had just gone to a Montreal Canadiens hockey game, and then was head, heading home and uh, was going to kill himself. He said, whatever you're planning on doing, I just felt to call you and tell you, come to church with me instead tonight. So he talked him into it. He came, gave his life to the Lord. And then the first time I ever had a Dallas preach, I wanted her to preach before that, but she wanted The first time I ever successfully talked her into preaching was in 2016 in Montreal. So he got saved that night, but then was afraid to come into crowds to go to church. He was having panic attacks and stuff. And Adonis preached her first message on fear. And he said, when I watched that, it set me free. And so I had, I FaceTimed Adonis right then and had her, him tell her. Because anytime I bring up her preaching there, she always says, oh, that was the worst sermon. That didn't help anybody. They were there to hear you. And right then, God used her to, to set that guy free. And now he's in the ministry full time. Can you say amen? The, the one kid that you're going to see testify 
His mother brought him up and said, would you pray for his shoulder? And you could tell he had this look in his eye like, my mom's nuts. This is nuts. But, you know, I'm a child, so my mom's making the preacher pray for my shoulder. Go ahead. So I just prayed. The service was over. Nice little prayer for like a, like a half Presbyterian prayer for his shoulder because I could tell he was uncomfortable. I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for loosening up his shoulder in Jesus' name. They didn't tell me anything that was wrong with him. And then he went like, I said, see if you can move it any better. And he went like this. Like that. Like you could tell he was stunned that it worked. So watch. This is all within six days. And I was so torn about whether to extend the meeting or not. Because, um, I, mean, I mean, that kind of momentum, we had the altar packed almost every service. We were doing day services. Now think of this. On Sunday morning, there's 75 people. Friday morning, we had 205 and we never had less than 160 for, for any of the day services. So Canada, it's like people have been caged for three years and then somebody opened the door and let them out. You wouldn't have been able to tell. If you talk to preachers, you would think uh, Canada's the deadest place. It had that reputation. You could hear the singing coming out of the building as you drove up to the parking lot. So I want to show you what the Lord did. And then it looks like things aren't going too bad here either. It's just great to be a part of what God's doing all over the world. Amen. I really love you. I, if I could cut myself in thirds, I would be here every Sunday. But it, I took health class, I would just die. If you got yourself in thirds, there's not like three of you that can go past your different places. So I thought it through, and I decided to stay one person. And uh, coming down once a month pains me. I wish I could do it more, and I wish I could have stayed in Vancouver for a second week. But what we did is we um, had sign-ups. There were a bunch of pastors there. A pastor flew in from Finland for the week of meetings. A man flew in from Valencia, Spain that w never got vaccinated and was scouring the internet. Now, you imagine not getting that. It's hard enough in Texas. People think it was easy down here. It wasn't. And, but, but Spain, he said he was one of three people in his church of 400 that want to get And everybody was pressuring. So he, lo he looked and found our ministry and has been watching it for two years. Flew for the whole week of meetings from Spain. And uh, it... Let me tell you something. I have such an excitement in my spirit about what God's going to do all this year. And uh, I know God's not going to leave us hanging dry this morning. How many of you are ready to have the best morning in the house of God you've ever had? Go ahead and show what, what the Lord did. Canada, Canada suffered hard lockdowns and strict mask policies. Now Canadians are threatened by the new liberal online harms bill to make speaking out against LGBTQ punishable up to life in prison. Life in prison. But God's not finished with Canada. God is sending a mighty revival to Western Canada. The thief, Look at that. the devil, who From goes 75. about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, with three missions, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And if there was ever a generation that's been stolen from, killed, and destroyed, destroyed marriages, destroyed children, destroyed minds, it's this generation. But thank God there is an answer, a church that goes out and carries the fire of God to set the captive free. I could move it higher than this or this, but now I can just move it all over. So thankful uh, for Evangelist Jonathan and the ministry because God used him to save my life. You couldn't have this meeting six feet apart and masked and every other row. It was the devil's attempt to stop the move of God in Canada. But guess what? Just like everything else the devil does, his attack failed and God is going to shake the provinces of Canada, the islands of Canada, the rivers of Canada, the meadows of Canada, the mountains of Canada, one more time with the power of the Holy Ghost. Let, let me tell you one more thing. Um, there's, a, there's a suit store uh, by where my house is. You, 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 guys, uh, you ever been to those shops, South Lake Center? So I went, there, there's, a, there's a suit place there, and the lady is from Iran. So the last time I went to buy suits there, I was, it was like today. Like, I'm going to fly to Georgia. If you're watching, I'm going to be in Columbus, Georgia, starting tonight uh, somehow at 7 o'clock. And then 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday through Friday again, just like we did in Canada. So I was in a hurry like that. I was just going real quick to get, uh, I think I need, I need a couple sport coats. I think last time I was heading to Africa, and I had all, like, wool, and it was going to be, like, 195. So I wanted to get something that was a little lighter. So I went to, um, 
I went to this place, and the lady said, mentioned that she was from Iran. And for some reason, it just popped in. This is like a month ago. I said, uh, you don't have any family, because she had looked me up. This was my second time buying clothes there. So the last time, maybe because I was so nice or whatever, she, she looked me up and said, hey, I saw you're a preacher. I said, yeah. She said, do you ever preach here? I said, I have a, I have a church here. And then she told me she's Iranian. I said, do you have any family in Vancouver by any chance? She went, that's actually where I immigrated into. I'm the only one of my family that lives in Texas. All my family's in Vancouver. I said, well, I'm going to be there in three weeks. I said, I'd love to meet the rest of your family. She got this, you know, you don't want to generalize or stereotype, but Arabic people in general do not suggest people go somewhere or invite people. She said, my sister and my niece will be there. I guarantee it. I said, really? I said, you're going to text them that some guy bought suits from you twice and they have to go travel and go here and preach and they're going to go? She went, I guarantee you they will be there. I said, all right, I believe you. Well, sure enough, Mon Monday, they said, there's a, there's a lady here from Texas that said, you know her sister and she wants to meet you. I forgot all about that. So I'm trying to think who we have that goes to our church here in Texas that has a sister in Vancouver. It was that, that sales uh, the, the, the manager from the store's sister. She said, my sister told me I have to be here. And so I'm here. So she was there. Then she came back Thursday night with her daughter. So the sister and daughter both came forward and received Jesus Christ and had hands laid on and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then I'll go see the sister this afternoon to give her <laughs> the good news. And then after they, they got done getting touched by God, she said, my sister said I have to take a picture with you and send it to her. So it's like hostage stuff, like to, to prove she actually did it. Man, it was a great week. So what we did was we got all the pastors to sign up that want to help, kind of like we did in Los Angeles. And um, we're going to go back in 90 days, 100 days, look at venues, and we're going to plan a proper crusade. And I've seen these weeks that we're on the road, it's like things have just organically moved into theaters and, and convention centers and, and stuff and ballrooms, so like it did at the casino in, in Las Vegas. So I'm just I'm, I can see that prophecy that Pastor Rodney Howard Brown get, gave that 2020 through 2023, there was a dark cloud over the whole earth, and then God's hand moved that cloud and gave the church one more window to operate. And let me tell you something: at this Revival Today Church Fort Worth, Revival Today Church Pittsburgh, we are taking that thing by the tail. And we're going to blow the thing up these three years in Jesus' mighty name. Can you say amen? This is great. Really great. This is awesome and awesome to be a part of. So I'm thankful that you're here. I'm sure they've introduced to you. If you're in Pittsburgh, this, they're going to give you one of these if they haven't already. Operation Andrew. Invite seven people. This is, I stole this from a Baptist preacher. You may have never heard of him. His name small ministry. His name is Billy Graham. And uh, th this, is, this is how they built their ministry. I had a chance to go out with his crusade director a few times, Dr. Coldiron. He was 85 at the time. He was Billy Graham's crusade director, I think, for 60 years. And he said, of all the people that were in the stadium, uh, it wasn't the TV or the billboards or radio. 85% of everybody that came to his crusades and made decisions for Christ were invited and brought by a friend. So it's not just a casual, hey, if you want to come to church, I'll be there. Invited and brought by a friend. Let's, let's make next Sunday our record-setting Sunday for Revival Today Church. Let's, uh, Fort Worth and Pittsburgh. I want you to make a list of people you, you can bring, people you meet. There's a statistic that 82% of people, if they were invited to church at Easter time, if they were invited, they would go. People are looking to go to church at, e at Easter. And so next week... We're going to have, we're not having just a couple of Easter songs and a nice service. If it, we're going to make it a service that if somebody's coming to church one time, they're going to experience the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's going to be off the hook. So if you'll help me with that in Pittsburgh and here, I'd, I'd appreciate it. My father's coming to preach down here. So you're going to have a better, uh, as my grandfather said, the original is always better than the duplicates. So you're, you're going to have the original here and you're going to have a great meeting. Do we have Good Friday back in Pittsburgh? Why not? I didn't see it on the schedule. We are having Good Friday. We will always have Good Friday till the end of time. Friday, Saturday, the crusade, and then Sunday. So Pittsburgh, get that on the schedule. Announce it after I turn the service back over to you. I guess we'll have it at 107, but that'll be our Good Friday service at 7 p.m. back in Pittsburgh. 
And um, then here, my father's going to be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? Under the tent in, how do you pronounce that town? I just got, I just figured out Wataga. Now I got this halt, Haltum. Say it again. Haltum. Haltum. That shouldn't be that difficult. Pretty sad when you only know one language and you still can't get half of those words. So Haltum City, my father's going to be preaching that. And let me tell you, if you bring people to my dad's meetings, they'll get saved. My dad has a powerful anointing to call people to Christ, among other things. And uh, let's just give the devil the worst week he's ever had. Amen? Give the Lord another great hand clap in Pittsburgh and Texas. And let's dismiss in prayer. Father, no, just kidding. If you have your Bible, I want you to open your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I started barely a message last week entitled, Who You Are where you're positioned, what you have, and what you can do in Christ. Those are also the points. And I am an evangelist, and I always will be, but by the grace of God, I pastor these churches, and there's things after you get born again that you need taught. And I would put this, after you've given your life to Jesus Christ, this may be number one of what you need to know. So I'm, I'm taking a Sunday now. Next week, we'll be in the Resurrection Sunday so I want to knock this thing out. What happens when you get born again? Who are you now? Where are you positioned now? What do you have now? Do you have anything? Did you grow up in a church that basically told you when you got saved, you gave everything up, and one day in heaven you'll have everything? What do you have now according to the Bible? And then four, what can you do? What does the Bible say you can do now? For example, how'd that kid's shoulder get healed? Well, I read in the Bible as a, as a young man, that these signs will follow them that believe. I don't have to have a special healing ministry. I don't have to feel a heat in my hand. I don't have to see an angel. These signs will follow everyone who believes. They will lay their hands on the sick, and the sick will recover. So when that mom brought the son for prayer, I didn't think, well, you know, let, let's take it easy now. No, I know there's things I can do now, now that I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, that I couldn't do before or didn't have access to. So let's get into all of them. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man be in Christ, he has become a new creature. The old life is dead. Behold, all things become new. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. What does the new creature mean? It, new is the opposite of old, and creature is a tense on create. So it's literally the exact opposite of what they'll tell you in 90% of churches. And it's not, pick it, it, they won't tell you it in the Catholic church. They won't tell you it in most assemblies of God churches. So it it's not, you're not picking on one group. The Protestants know it, but the Catholics don't. For some reason, with that scripture being plain as day, if any man regardless of who they are or where they come from, is in Christ. Everybody say, in Christ. That's what you become when you're a Christian. In him, we live and move and have our being. They are a new creature. I mean, now we're all just sinners saved by grace. No. The sinner is dead. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you find out that Jesus lived Jesus died, and Jesus was raised from the dead. In the epistles, you find out, you died with Christ, and you were raised from the dead and positioned with him. The gospels tell you about Christ. The epistles tell you about you in Christ. Can you say amen? amen. Romans 6, 1. This is in the New Living Translation. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined? Now, this is in Christ, in Christ, with him. What I've done for this message is I marked out all the places. There's a pastor who was from Texas, from McKinney, Texas. He's, in, he's with the Lord now. His name was Kenneth Hagin. And he used to say, every believer should mark out in the Bible every place it says, in him, with him, uh, uh, in Christ, with Christ, through Christ. 
so that you'll know who you are. He would always say that, but then I looked, there's no books on it or anything, so I marked them out for you. Had a little help from ChatGPT. I said, ChatGPT, AI, give me every scripture that says in Christ, with Christ, on down the line, and then, uh, you know, even ChatGPT, AI said, this is a very important subject to Christianity to know who you are in Christ. So ChatGPT is ahead of many preachers, amen. <laughs> And then what I did was, when I got that long list of scriptures, I categorized them into those four groups. What does the Bible tell you about you? Because you've heard me preach before, your faith will never rise higher than your own confession. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life is in the power of? I'm just a sinner. Can you pray that God helps me be free from sin? There's no point in me praying. Your confession is, I am a sinner. If you're going to confess and death and life's in the power of the tongue, you're wasting our time praying. But if you see who you are in Christ and say the sinner is dead, I'm a new creature, I am the righteousness of God in Christ, then you're, the devil's going to have a major problem. And I see the devil having a major problem in your life the rest of this year in Jesus' name. If you believe it, can you shout a loud amen? amen. Of course not. Since we have died, we have died. See, there's strange language here in the epistles. We have died. Paul said, it's no longer I that lives. Who talks like that? You're going to go for an appointment this week. Uh, what was your date of birth? I'm actually, I died. And uh, it's no longer I that lives, but Christ lives in me. They're going to send you to a different floor of the hospital and load you full of benzodiazepine. They, they don't understand that. But the Bible says in the spirit, there is a, that's why I don't use any of those terms. Christ follower, Christ chaser, a presence pursuer. I like, the, I like the term that went good for 1900 and some years. Born again Christian. I've been, say out loud, I've been born again. And the Bible says, when, when Jesus explained that in John chapter 3, he said it's a spiritual rebirth. When you come to the altar and give your life to the Lord, you don't leave, now you have four eyes and two noses and your skin is a different color than the rest of the world. No, you look the same. And your family will be happy to remind you. Yeah, I know you think you joined that church and now everything's different. You're the, they'll try to tell you you're the same. But the Bible says there's a transformation that doesn't take place on the outside. It takes place on the inside. But I will tell you, over time, and it won't take much time, it will start to affect the outside. Some of you look different than when we started the church in October. You were sick or you had disease in your blood and you can already see the vibrancy and the joy on your face that you didn't have. We used to sing a song growing up in church, Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. This all starts with the revelation that I'm not who I used to be. The Bible says in Romans 6, I'm not an abuse victim trying to get free or an addict trying to recover. The abuse victim is dead. The addict is dead. The person that suffered from depression is dead. Nevertheless, I live, but it's no longer I that lives, but Christ liveth in me. <laughs> Man, great to be back in Texas. Praise God. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. So you can actually use that scripture if you want. Would you like to come to my son Micah's birthday party? I can't. Why not? I died. <laughs> According to Romans chapter 6. So I cannot come to your party. I'll be unable to attend. We died and were buried with Christ by baptism. So even baptism is to be a signal. That's trying to get it through our thick heads. That it's you. Dead. Yeah you alive and it's amazing that God not only gave that as an illustration but as sister Carrie Underwood said when she got baptized there must have been something in that water no it's not that there's something in the water it's that the, <laughs> there's God's power in you and when you act on the word you feel his power can you say amen, amen. so it's trying to get that through us it, the old Jonathan speech impaired crooked legs and braces he died and a new him came to life same with you Verse 5, since we have been, uh, sorry, second part. We have been raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father so that we may also live new lives. Everybody say, I can live a new life. Yeah, the Bible says so. Now remember, don't leave here 
and say, John, you know, that Pastor Jonathan, we went to that church at Lifestyle Christianity, and he, was, he said that we're, no, I didn't write Romans. I just yell it at you. It's, it's the word of God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Since we have been united with him. Everybody say, I'm united with Christ. In his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. Now, that, you're never wrong when you quote God. So every time you feel like saying, I don't think I can live that way, I battle, instead of saying, I battle alcoholism, try every time you feel that way, loosen life out of your mouth, out of the word of God instead, and saying, thank you, Father, I am no longer a slave to sin. I, and then you can take sin out and put a, a, whatever sin or thing that's unclean or not part of redemption in there. Thank you, Father. I don't battle depression. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Now, if you talk like that, the devil will leave you alone because he hates being in the atmosphere of the Word of God. I tell you again, I see everything the enemy's tried to trip you up with, leaving your life permanently today in Jesus' mighty name. We are no longer slaves to sin. I mean, we all sin. No, you, you, you're welcome to say that if you want, Mr. Other Preacher. But I tell you, if I did sin every day, I want to go up and announce it from a pulpit. I'd turn the mic to, to Kofi and go to try to get free at the altar. I would just brag. You know, I'll sin. You know, I sinned yesterday. I'll sin today and we'll sin tomorrow. You'll go to hell. <laughs> you just run around sinning. <laughs> That's the whole point of Christianity is to stop sinning. Jesus didn't catch the woman in the act of adultery and say, neither do I condemn you. Keep on going on. <laughs> I'm not going to stop you from committing adultery. We all do. We all sin differently. Some of us punch people when we're angry. Some of us commit adultery. Others pick up stones to kill people who have thrown adultery. It's all sin. And we'll all sin. No, the Bible doesn't teach that we will die in heaven and then be raised to life. It teaches that we have died now to sin. I'm telling you, you're going to experience something after this Sunday where the part of you that was alive unto sin, the Bible says if you mortify the deeds of the flesh, you can put the flesh under subjection to the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. Everybody say, I'm not sinning. Yeah, you're not now. You're sitting still. And there's almost none of those lists of sins you can do just sitting on a pew, I can tell you that. So why, why, why make plans to sin? Why not make a confession of righteousness? Why, why, well, I'll sin today. I displeased God yesterday. I displeased God today. I'll displease him again tomorrow. No, I didn't displease God yesterday. And I, I haven't had time even if, if I wanted to. I haven't displeased him. I flew here, preached to you, and then I'll be flying to Georgia to go preach there. I'm... I'm uh, there's not even time. There's no chance I'm going to do anything to displease God. I won't, I won't even have the opportunity because I've scheduled my life in line with my assignment. Why make a plan in your mind? Well, you know, then what happens is when people get set free from something, they're just wondering how long it's going to last because we all sin. We're all bound by sin as long as we're in this human body. How many know as long as we're in this human body, we're going to get sick, but we'll never know Christ is healer unless we get sick? What scripture is that? You're making up your own religion. I don't have to know, I don't have to get sick to know God's a healer. I only have to know Exodus chapter 15 and Exodus 23. I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord that healeth thee. I'm not making plans to get sick. I'm making plans to get stronger. I'm not making plans to get in sin. I'm making plans to live holy and righteous under the coming of the Lord. I'm not making plans for defeat. I'm making a plan out of this word for victory. All right, I'm not finishing Romans 6 because then it's going to be the last week all over again. Colossians 1, 2. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So these epistles are written to you. You're not who you used to be. Everybody say, I'm a saint. He thinks he's some kind of saint. I don't think I am. I know I am. 
You know, even the things the devil criticizes you with are compliments. He's holier than us. Yeah, I'm glad you're beginning to notice. Amen. He's oh, you're holier than you're holier than thou now. Yes, the Bible says that we have been made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ. That, listen to this now. We have not been purified with the blood of bulls and goats, but we have had the blood of Jesus who, who carried his own blood into the holy of holies and offered it. The bulls and goats was to, was to keep it going until the perfect one could come. But I don't have bulls and goats uh, uh, sacrificed for me. I have the blood of Jesus that's been sprinkled over my head. That blood didn't make me kind of better or, or give me a little chance to, do, to get my butt kicked less by the power of the devil. Oh, no. I've been made pure. I've been made holy. And I want to tell you today in Texas, in Pittsburgh, you've been made pure. You've been made holy. Not by works, but by believing in the precious blood of Jesus Christ and its efficacy to set you free. Go ahead in Pittsburgh. Go ahead in, in Fort Worth. Take 15 seconds. Clap your hands, all you people. Somebody say the blood of Jesus. Number one, who you are in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. What are you in Christ Jesus? Jesus. Sanctified, that means made holy. Let me tell you something. And if I stop it at reverse, I'm going to miss the service in Georgia tonight. It's, it's very hard. It's very hard to just read these. They, they like come alive in you. Sanctified in Christ Jesus. If me, me and, me and um, Pastor Abraham, if we're two Christians, and I'm always saying I'm a sinner, and the Bible says death and life is in the power of the tongue, and Pastor Abraham has a revelation on the word of God. And instead of saying, I'm a sinner, starts to say, thank you, Jesus, that because of your blood and because I'm in you, I've been made holy. You start talking like that. I don't know if any of you ever played sports and had a good coach. And your coach somehow got you to believe, even though you basically had the same ability, you might have got a little better in practice. No, you can play cornerback and cover that guy. I'm going to tell you exactly how to do it. You're able to, and sort of make you feel like you were the reincarnation of Deion Sanders <laughs> playing corner. If you get somebody's mind to start thinking in a positive direction, they're going to do better than a coach that says, you suck. You know, you get burned on every play. I don't even know why you're on this team. That's not how you motivate people to do well. And so this isn't just a coach trying to get you to think better. These are actually based on facts and the things you say are based on the deception of the devil. I can't quit drinking. That is, the, that is a blasphemy against Philippians 4.13. I can do how many things? Through Christ who strengthens me. Who you are in Christ. Sanctified in Christ Jesus. Called to be saints. With all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We already read it before, twice. Let's read it again. Therefore, if any man, but you don't understand how bad my past. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they that which receive abundance of grace or the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Let me read that again. If by one man's offense, talking about Adam, death came, how much more they that are in Christ will receive an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness in Christ. It's yours. It comes with the package. Romans 8, 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him. So I'm telling you, the in him scriptures, through him, by him, because I'm in Christ. Now the Bible's telling you, the old you's dead, now here's what you have. Who am I? I am more than a conqueror. I'm a new creature. I am reigning as a king in this life. See, confessing that, 
That's what got me that plane. I don't, I don't have the, the, the mentality, the other, well, what does a preacher need a jet for? I'm not, uh, I'm not just a preacher. Because of the redemption of Christ, I'm a king in this life. The best of life belongs to me. So if I were you, you shouldn't feel bad about having 100 acres or 1,100 acres or whatever else because God didn't create the world as a gift to the devil's children. He made this world to be enjoyed by the people of God. That's where the, even, even the understanding of prosperity starts coming from there. Everybody say, I've been made a king in this life. I'll be guarded what I say. But when they tried to run us out of our church two Easter's ago up in Pittsburgh, and I went to the city council meeting, I'm not going to act like an idiot, but I did, when, it, when it hit a certain point and some people on the city council were saying things that I felt crossed the line, you know, you know we're, we're going to move you out of there. I said, you should be careful what you say. Because every one of you needs to know something. This is not an, a Waffle House or an IHOP. This is not some building that you, you pull a permit from. I said, this is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that church, you're going you're gonna to find out if you try to move it, it's different than moving a vape shop or a restaurant. And let me tell you something, it got quiet. And then as soon as the meeting ended, the chief of police came. He wasn't on the panel. He came and said, Reverend, you have a friend in me. I'm going to help you out. Why? Well, okay. Uh, no. I, yes, I'm a pastor. I love people. I'm a Christian. But this thing that I'm a part of is a holy thing. And, and it's not, don't treat it like it's some, it's some store. It's not the Verizon store. What we're doing today is holy. What we're doing changes lives. What we're doing drives the devil out of a city and brings the presence of God to a new generation. More than conquerors. Everybody say, I'm more than a conqueror. You know, that's the exact opposite of I struggle. So even if you're struggling, you want to know how to quit struggling? Start saying the Bible. Thank you, Father, I'm more than a conqueror. Thank you that you didn't make me some loser. Most people in their mind are some loser that's here to get slapped around by the devil. How many of you are being attacked this morning? You know you can attack back? Let me tell you something. I don't, I, this isn't going to take any time to get across in Texas. If somebody breaks into your house, do you call for prayer and, and say I'm being attacked? No prayer required except for that guy's family. Can you say amen? Oh, yeah, you handle it yourself. I'm not here to be attacked. This is my house. You've crossed the line, and now you're going to pay a heavy price. Well, if you can do that in the natural to people, how much more can you do it to unclean spirits who God doesn't even love? I'm not here to be attacked. I'm here and anointed to do the attacking in the Holy Ghost. I see you going on the attack all of this year in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody say more than a conqueror. Yeah. Do you know why I spoke with such confidence to that city council? Because you, this is not a battle I'm fighting. You, you do not have the ability to do what you're saying you're going to do. I would have talked the same way if I was in Yemen. Yeah, I had constitutional law on my side. But if God sent me to Oman or Yemen or Mogadishu to start a church, and instead of the city council in Pennsylvania, it was a group of Al-Shabib Al terrorists, that said, Reverend, out of, usually we just kill people, but I'm going to give you till Wednesday to pack your church up and go back to America. I would say what Dr. Benson Idahosa said when they did the same thing to him in Nigeria. If you're still alive on Tuesday, I'll tear my Bible in half. And they all went missing. And the people knew this is not some guy coming to preach the Bible among other religions. We serve the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And though the enemy tries to come in like a flood, the Spirit of God will come and drive him out of your life today in Jesus' mighty name. <laughs> Can't preach a sermon on every verse. Galatians 3.26. For ye are all, that means all of us, are children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Close both eyes and say this from your, your gut. Say, thank you, Father, thank you, Father that I'm your very own child. <laughs> I mean, no, we're all God's children. No, we're not. Jesus looked at a whole group of people and said, you're of your father, the devil. You're born in sin, shaping in iniquity, 
under the power of darkness. But the Bible doesn't say we're all God's children. The Bible says through faith in Jesus Christ. We are all God's, <laughs> say it again, I'm God's very own child. Amen. Now you start speaking like that, this world will start to treat you like you're God's very own child. That's not true. The Bible says there's persecution. Read the book of Acts. Read the book of Acts. There was persecution. Acts 16, Paul and, and Silas were beaten and thrown in prison. And there they died after an 11-year bout with scurvy from malnutrition. No. And they, they prayed and sang praises. Who sings praises after you got beat? Somebody that's more than a conqueror. Says, do whatever you want. You can't take my victory. My victory was given to me by Christ and no one can take it. And they sang praises unto God. And when they loosed that out of their mouth, suddenly there was a massive earthquake. The chains of every prisoner fell off and every prison door came open. They were persecuted in the early church. Yeah, read the rest of the chapter. What about Job? What about Job? Job was, was Job in Christ? No, he was not. And even in Job, Job 42.10, after 18 months, Bible scholars tell us, about 18 months, Job prayed for his friends, Job 42.10. And the Lord heard his prayer. And the Lord restored unto Job double everything that he lost. And he lived another 140 years after that, seeing his children's children to the fourth generation. I tell you, whatever attack has been launched against your life, that devil made a mistake having you come to church today in Pittsburgh and in Texas. That attack's going to flee as quick as it came. You're coming out of here who the Bible says you are. Not a struggler, more than a conqueror. Your victory is already guaranteed. Ephesians 1, 5. Somebody said good word. It is a good word because I'm just reading scriptures. It's just the word. All the notes are just scriptures. Ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Everybody say I'm God's very own child. Yeah, that's a much better thing to say than I'm an abuse victim. I'm a, I'm a single mother. What, what is that? That's not your identity. Your identity is first, I'm a child of God. Ephesians 1, 5. Having predestined us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. I'm in God's family. 1 John 4, 17. Herein, well, that's like a book of Exodus sneeze. Four years ago, that would have cleared this whole church up. 1 John 4, 17. Herein, <laughs> we take authority over that spirit. Sne sneeze, oh bub. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he, being Jesus, as he is, so are we in this world. That, that, is, that is a powerful scripture. As Jesus is, not as he was, not, not, don't, don't think cartoon Jesus or stained glass Jesus. Not as he was, and he wasn't even like that then. As he is. Well, how is he now? Where is he? The right hand of the Father in the place of authority. Eyes like flames of fire. Feet like bronze refined in the furnace. Hair white like wool. Some of you got that part right. I'm headed there myself. Amen. Two-edged sword proceeded out of his mouth. Voice like the sound of many waters. And when I heard him, I fell at his feet as one dead. That's how he is now. And as he is now, so are we in this world. Smith Wigglesworth, John G. Lake, anybody that had those type of manifestations in their ministry, they all have sermons on that verse. Because if you let that verse come alive in you, the devil will just go pick another target. As he is right now, so am I in this world. Because dead on the cross, Jesus doesn't live in me. The alive Christ lives in me. See, that's why, and, and I'm not picking on Catholics. I, I love Catholic people. Half my family grew up in the Catholic church. They're great people. They receive miracles easy. But there's a reason a lot, and it's not just them. Episcopal, 
There's a reason why religion wants you to see Jesus emaciated with his ribcage showing and a frown nailed on the cross. Because then when you read those scriptures that were to be like Christ, you think victim. But Jesus actually became a victim on the cross and died my death. Then when he rose from the dead, he gave me his resurrection life. That the things that disarmed him can never disarm me because I'm in Christ. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as Jesus is, so am I in this world. Say it out loud, as Jesus is, is. so am I in this world. world. Number one, who you are, that's who you are. As he is, so are you. Number two, where you're positioned, Romans 5, 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Where are you positioned? Justified. I just, oh God, you know, I was telling him I've done so much wrong. He, he forgave you and justified you. Everybody say, I'm justified. <laughs> you know, that's where, that's where people get off with the book of Job. What about Job? You know, I hear you saying all this, but what about Job? Job, the enemy came to him. Job was not justified through faith in Christ. There was no Christ to have faith in. That's why he actually prophesies in that book, I know my Redeemer lives, and though I haven't seen him, one day he'll stand upon the earth, and and I will see my Redeemer. Yeah, I will see him. He's not here. So Job was justified by his own works. Satan tested him. He had to prove his justification to God. But no New Testament believer could ever have happened to them what happened to Job. Because Job justified himself by his works. But the Bible says, I'm justified by faith in Christ and what he did for me. If you're thankful for it, can you say amen? amen. Romans 8.1, where am I positioned? There is now therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but walk after the Spirit. As I'm in Christ and yield to the Spirit, God's not looking to condemn me. I'm justified. Some people think God's, oh, church is the last place I should be God. I know I've done. No, 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 no. Everybody say, I'm, I'm, there's no condemnation. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. But to us there is but one God, the Father of whom all things, and we in him. Everybody say, I'm in him. I'm positioned in him. P- Pastor Kofi, I don't like using you for illustrations because you're too classy, but let me use you for a good one. Okay, Kofi is Christ. Face this way. And then I'm here. I'm in him. Any demon that's going to attack me has to get through who first? Has that demon been created? No. So there's no, I mean, you know, we still carry curses in our blood. What scripture is that? That we all still carry curses in our bloodline. You made that up to sell a 40-day deliverance pack for $399.99. That's not even the Bible. You want to know when you understand that? Thanks, brother. And great job in Ghana. How many appreciate Pastor Kofi? I know I do. Did you know I taught this, a form of this, to the new believers class in uh, uh, Liberia when I was with Bishop Dagg at 7 in the morning? And I just taught on how the devil's under our feet, this aspect of in Christ. Now that you're a Christian, I know they talk witches and demons here. Those witches and demons have no... It's like talking about ants or uh, I don't even know. Not, I, won't, I wouldn't even say bees or spiders because they can bite you. But it's, they're just like nothing. They're under your feet. Yeah, they're there, but we're not in the same kingdom. Right. Well, you want to know how that manifested when I taught like that? I didn't go, oh, in the name of Jesus, I come against you. I said, everybody line up, I'm going to lay hands on you. I went down the line and laid hands on everybody. And a man testified that night that in the morning service, before he became a Christian at Bishop Dag's crusade the night before, he went to get help from a witch, and the witch gave him a ring. And if he, he couldn't take it off, if he ever went to try to take it off, he said a woman would appear to him that was a demon who looked like a woman. Some of them are like trans. And then uh, the, the, they're all male is what I'm saying. There's no women demon. They, they just appear and look like them. So the, the, the spirit who he thought was a woman would appear to him and torment him, and he'd have to put it back on. He said, when you laid hands on me, and I wasn't pushing in the, just going down the line, there was a half a mile of people to pray for. Yeah. 
that morning. It wrapped halfway around a one-mile track around the soccer field. So I laid hands on him uh, quick. He said, I went out under the power, and when I did, the, I hit the ground, and the ring shot off my finger. Now, that doesn't happen. As fat as I'm getting, I was thinking, I need to lay hands on myself to get this ring off, because the last couple of times I've had some, <laughs> need like bacon grease. He said he fell off, and the ring shot off, and when the ring shot off into the grass, that, one, that spirit that looks like a woman appeared to him, and he said, as it moved closer to me, fire came down from heaven and burned it up, and it screamed and went away. Yeah. That, where'd that come from? That came from the Word. Everybody say the Word. How did Jesus send the devil on the run? Three scriptures. I'm not giving you three. I'm giving you about all of them on in who you are in Christ. The Bible says one of the things that it does is it renews your mind. Your mind used to think defeat and satanic attack and generational curses, but you're after today, your mind's going to think victory and in Christ, and as he is, so are we in this world. And we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Everybody say, I'm in Christ. Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, or in Christ. The right, I mean, no, we're all sinners. I'm telling you, that is... You're going to get in trouble on Judgment Day if you're a preacher and you've told people that. I'm just telling you right now. It's going to be, it, it's, you're going to barely make it into heaven because the Bible, Jesus did a heavy work and paid a heavy price for you to not be a sinner. And you're telling people we're all sinners. It, didn't you tell me in Louisiana that's really what clicked with you and then you just quit sinning? Because well, we all sin. If somebody tells you we all sin, if you had a football coach and, you, and he told you, we all, we all make mistakes on every play, you're going to have a messed up team because people aren't even trying to get better because you told them that's how it goes. But when, when you lay something out as a coach that we're going to do this, this, and this, Hendricks, I need you to cover this side and make sure that's your responsibility. Well, even if he messes up, the next play, he knows he's supposed to do that, and he's going to get back on his feet and do it again. But if you, by religion, lull everybody to sleep, cancer's normal, sin's normal, addiction's normal, how many churches this morning do you think the pastor's standing up and telling everybody, we're all in a mental health crisis? If you confess that, you actually are like a magnet for demons. But when you flip your confession and say, no, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I have righteousness, peace, soundness of mind. What Jesus said belongs to me. I take it now. I'm not a Say it, say it so the devil can hear you. Say, I'm not a sinner. I'm not a sinner. Say, the sinner's dead. Now say this, say 2 Corinthians 5.21. Tells me I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Close both eyes and lift your right hand up high. Say it one more time. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. He became sin for me so that I can have his righteousness. He became sin for you so that you can have his righteousness. You're not a dirty sinner. You're a holy saint, and you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Philippians 3.9. You better be clapping in Pittsburgh. I'm going to come back up there. <laughs> Philippians 3.9. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And God count, Abraham believed those things that were spoken unto him, and God counted it as righteousness to him because of his faith. Believing God's word uh, ascribes righteousness to the believer. So you have to... That's why Paul said, make sure no man beguiles you from the simplicity of the gospel. Because it's simple. You don't have to order a deliverance pack. You know, and I'm not trying to make an enemy out of literally every ministry in America. 
But when I see people on television, we're here at the Wailing Wall, and I'm touching it right now. And if you'll send your prayer request, then we'll pray from the Wailing Wall. I could pray from Bucky's <laughs> and get the same thing you're getting at the Wailing Wall. Because it's not where you are in the physical, it's where you've been positioned in the spirit. Hallelujah. I'm not looking for the upper room. I don't have to be at the empty tomb. I don't have to be anywhere. Wherever the sole of my foot shall tread, I'm on land that God's given to me. You know what? I might just mock all those people. I might, I might take Nick and Jake and Rom and shoot for TV and say, I want all of our partners to know and those watching, I'm at the brisket counter at Bucky's right now. <laughs> and if you send in your prayer request, I'm going to give a prayer from the brisket counter at Bucky's, and I'm going to, I'm going to, and God's going to hear us from this place because this is a special place. Now, Jerusalem's God's city. I know I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trivializing Jerusalem or Israel. This church sent a, 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 an ambulance to Israel. We believe, we don't just pray for them, we help them. But when it comes to faith and healing, if you'll give $100, we'll send you olive oil made from the olives in Jerusalem. Who cares? It's not the olives that heal. It's Jesus, the great physician, and acting on his word. It's faith in God. It's faith in God. Somebody say the word. word. You know, I had my ancestry done. I'm actually 124th Jewish. So now my prayers will get 124th answered more. No. There is no longer Jew or Greek. All who put their faith in Jesus Christ, Galatians 3, are the true seed of Abraham. When you get born again, you're not 124th Jewish. You're 100% a child of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Go ahead, put those hands together. Let God know. Hallelujah. Yeah, Shuttlesworth, Ortiz, Hernandez, Terman. I'm not even going to try Kofi's last name. Ashapong. Sarpong, right, too? Sarpong. I'll go Sarpong. I can do that. Sarpong. I don't care what your background is. That's why look, at, look across the room. That's why this isn't a gathering of white people. Notice they had to change it when they criticized our, our churches like this. They had to change it from white nationalist to Christian nationalist. Because you can't look at this church and say it's a white church. You got more diversity here than at the United Nations. Because Jesus isn't the lamb that was slain for one group of people on the earth. He's the lamb that was slain for every tongue, every tribe, every nation, and every race. If you receive that today in Pittsburgh, if you receive that today in Fort Worth, clap your hands one more time. Give that Jesus a great big shout. I preach for a guy up in... I won't say what state, but it was New York. And I preached it in New York. And this guy, this guy, you know, he's had the church forever. This is 15 years ago. And he's telling me, you know, we're real proud. When we had built this church, we had water trucked in from the Sea of Galilee and poured it all over the foundation. There was less than 40 people on Sunday. There's been less than 40 people for 40 years at that church. I almost felt like saying, is that what's keeping everyone away? It's not the Sea of Galilee that's powerful. It's the one who walked on the Sea of Galilee who's powerful. It's not the trees that grow in Jerusalem. It's Jesus. The Bible is about Jesus. It's not about ingredients for olive oil. These, we're going to send you an olive. We're going to send you an anointing oil that's made with the same ingredients of the anointing oil that was used in the Bible. I'm telling you, it's amazing what's happened in church history. The Protestants rebelled against the Catholics because the Catholics were selling indulgences. And now if you turn on Catholic television, they're not selling ever anything. And Christian television, they're selling anything that's not nailed down. <laughs> Catherine Kuhlman sat on this chair in IHOP. We'll send you a section of the chair. How about I was making fun of a guy? 
on Twitter because I couldn't help it. He was laying on the grave of I can't remember who. See, if you don't get what I'm preaching to you, you're going to be on a hunt to Smith Wigglesworth's grave. Jonathan, when you come to England, I actually know the people who have Smith Wigglesworth's old home in Bradford, England. You can come and go to the living room and, and um, be in his home. What made Smith Wigglesworth valuable? is not in his grave and it's not in his living room. It's the fire of the Holy Ghost and the blood of Jesus. Nobody took that off the earth with them. It's available to every one of us that are hungry and thirsty and will believe the word. Somebody say, I'm in Christ. People keep telling you, you need to go to Jerusalem. I said, I'm going to go. I'm just waiting for the leadership to change. Then I'm going to have a house there. Can you say amen? amen? My grandfather ran 26 tours to Israel. I'm not knocking it. But when people think you have to be in a geographic location, let me tell you something right now. You feel the presence of God in this church because obviously there's a change in atmosphere when people have been standing and singing together for, four, for 30 minutes and then you heard the word through Pastor Adonis. So that's what you're feeling. You can be... You know what you can be. You are as anointed as a believer. Standing in your socks and Nike wind pants in your living room as you are in this church. The anointing doesn't stay in the church. The anointing, it was never the will of God to dwell in vessels made by human hands. Know ye not that you... You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. The anointing abides in you because you abide in Christ. One more time, in Pennsylvania, in Texas, all over the world, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God. In America, charismatics have basically turned into Catholics. Got to touch something. I preach in churches, you know, all the time, almost every week. In, in full gospel churches. For everyone that gives tithes today, we have crosses carved out of olive wood from Jerusalem. All right, whatever. Tell me what that does, a cross made out of olive wood from Jerusalem. Can you tell me scripturally what that does? Does it ward off Dracula's? <laughs> Do you have a stake and a silver bullet as well? Do you have a clove of garlic I can carry with me? And then a dream catcher? And then a uh, uh, rosary bead? Let's just get the whole thing. Let's just go straight back. Uh, let's go 500 years into the past before anybody had any light on the word of God. And let's just undo everything that's been done. This is Brother Jonathan's sport coat that he wore back when the, great, when the church was being built. That's why you have churches outgrow their buildings and they have a split over it. I don't want to leave that building. My grandfather... Brother Abrams put the first brick in the foundation. Yeah, that's how buildings are built. Then you outgrow it. And you don't cling to the past. Yeah, you thank God for what he's done. I've gleaned much off of Wigglesworth. But I didn't glean off of his living room or his grave. I gleaned off of his revelation of the word of God. There's no great man of God that was ever trying to tell you that if you can get to my grave when I die, or whatever. They were spending their life showing you the secrets they found in the Bible, and they're not, say this worth me, say open secrets. Open secrets. Every secret in the Bible is an open secret. What I say to one, I say to all. That's why people think, Jonathan, when you get done preaching, you think we could go out to lunch one day? You think I'm like preaching like some stuff here, but the stuff I really know about going into the forest and laying on graves? I save that for IHOP <laughs> when I'm at a table with a few people. No. Say what I say to one, I say to all. That's what I'm teaching from the Bible. Say I'm in Christ. God forbid they ever find the Ark of the Covenant. They'll have that thing cut up into pieces, selling it for $1,000 seeds, on whatever network finds it first. We're standing here by the actual Ark of the Covenant. I, I'm telling you, you, if you were here right now, you can literally feel the presence of God. No, you can't. The presence of God's not in that box. 
The presence of God's not in a grave. Next week we're going to celebrate that the presence of God can't stay in a grave. He got up. Then he gave gifts to his children. I don't have to go somewhere to find it. Only believe. Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. First John 4.13. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he's given us his spirit. Colossians 1.27 To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. What's the mystery? Christ in you. The hope of glory. Colossians 2.6-7 as, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Walk ye in him. The Bible tells you you can walk your life out in Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, where am I positioned? For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody say, I'm not appointed to wrath. So let's say it in plain English. Say, God's not mad at me. And I'm talking to Christians. If you're watching and you're in the U.S. Senate, he's very angry. He doesn't like you at all. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, but at the same time, I'm, I'm not kidding. But I'm going to move on. First, First John 4.13. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us. Hereby know we. I just don't feel it. Quit going by how you feel and go up by what the Bible says. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us. Say, I dwell in Christ, and Christ dwells in me. For he hath given us his spirit. That changed my ministry because I read in John G. Lake's book when I was in Bible college that when he, before he'd pray, he said, I'd look myself in the mirror and say, I'd put my hand on my chest and say, thank you, Father God, that you dwell in this man and in this suit of clothes, and where this man in this suit of clothes goes, God goes. So I got the revel that, he got that revelation from the word. So then I, I quit doing what they would do in the assemblies of God before they'd preach, where, you know, where you'd be talking in the office and go, well, service is about to start. Let's all gather around Brother Kofi. Come on, everybody, put your hands on. Oh, God, anoint our speaker today. There's always this mentality that like you get anointed at church and then you leave and go back to regular life. That's why I always liked Batman and never liked Superman. I never understood why somebody that had superpowers would go work at a newspaper. I would just stay in the tight and capes. <laughs> Tights and capes all day. Why would you change back? And so that's what they taught Christianity as. Like when the devil's attacking, you get anointed. When somebody needs healed, oh God. But the Bible says you have that anointing always. 1 John 4, 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us his spirit. He gave it to me. I don't have to ask for it. Brother Abraham, here's my Bible. For the sake of this illustration, it's yours. Now say, please give me your Bible. You sound like a lunatic because you're asking for something I already gave you. And there's Christians, I posted something on Twitter a couple days ago. I said, there's two kinds of prayers that never get result. Asking God to do what he told you to do. Oh Lord, go to the nations. No, he told you to go to the nations. And then two, asking God to do what his word tells you he's already done. Please save me. Please save me. Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus into the world and he died that I might live. He was raised that I might be raised. I receive salvation that's been freely given to me in Jesus' mighty name. So from this day forward, you're going to leave this meeting and you're never going to spend one minute asking God for what he's already done. That's what changed in me at 19. I quit saying, oh, Lord, anoint me. Is it going to preach to these teenagers? Oh, send your healing power instead. And boy, it made you feel so much better. Father, thank you. 
that your spirit lives in me and I live in you. And as I go to the pulpit, you come with me to work the works of the Bible in these teenagers' lives. I'm not trying to get his presence. I live in his presence and his presence lives in me. You're not trying to get his presence. His presence lives on the inside of you. Number three, what you have. What do I have because I'm in Christ? Romans 5.1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. I need peace. You have peace, but I don't feel it. That's because you keep saying I don't have it. Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8.10, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life. Because of righteousness. If Christ be in you. Everybody say he is. The body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is alive and full of righteousness. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. What do I have? But thanks be unto God. Who giveth us the victory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Say it so the devil can hear you. I'm not trying to get victory. I have the victory. I was preaching at a meeting. They had three preachers preaching that night, and I was the second one. The first one they had go, it was right when they were legalizing gay marriage. This guy, you'd have thought God died. I can't believe the church has allowed this to happen. And then he closed out. He said, I was getting irritated, full of unbelief, place is dead, because unbelief brings death. And he goes, I'm going to tell you right now, we're in the fourth quarter of a game, and the church is down by two touchdowns, and God wants to see who's going to rally and win the fight. Then he left. Nobody clamped. You know, everybody's just beaten down. You'd have thought they were the nine people on the Supreme Court that, that legalized it. And then he hands me the mic, dead as a doornail. I was so irritated. It's a wonder I ever get invited anywhere. I said, I don't know what God that guy serves, but I'm going to tell you right now. I'm not in a game down by two touchdowns trying to win the fight. 2,000 years ago, Jesus already won the game, and he made us more than conquerors celebrating in his procession. Three pastors got up and ran around the building. It put life in that place. There's many Christians. They think they're trying to get victory. I, mean, I just need to pray. And if you'll pray for me, I need, and I need, and I, no, you're beaten down. You're already defeated. If you understand, you stupid devil, you think I'm going to fall for your mess? My, I'm not having sickness in my house. I'm not having divorce. I'm not having a broken home. I have the victory through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Somebody say, I got the victory. Galatians 3.14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. That we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. Ephesians 1.3. What do I have? Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who hath blessed us. Not will bless us. One day in heaven. No. Not will, not is, hath, has. One day, how I many know some of us will get our blessings here, but others of us will never see them until we get to heaven? No! A thousand times, no! Ephesians 1 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has blessed us. Everybody say, he has blessed us. With what? I forgot I'm in Texas. Everybody already knows the Bible. With every spiritual blessing. I have it. Somebody say, I have it. I'm basically teaching the same stuff Andrew Womack teaches. I'm just like Andrew Womack if he did meth. Like a little bit of meth. Just a little bit. Everybody say, in Christ. Amen. Ephesians 1, 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. We have, we, we're going to get or we have. Everybody say, we have. Amen. Redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of all our sins, according to the riches of his grace. Yeah. Ephesians 1, 11. In whom, in whom, also we have obtained an inheritance. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
being predestinate, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Everybody say, I have an inheritance. That airplane's part of that inheritance. The buildings we're given is part of that inheritance. Because my father's not a billionaire or even a multi-billionaire. My father owns all the silver and he owns all the gold. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and I'm left in the will and all things are yours through Christ. Ephesians 2.18, for through him, I don't know how it feels in Pittsburgh, but I can tell you it's hot, it's hot in the spirit in here. Yeah. Ephesians 2.18, for through him we both have access by one spirit yes. unto the Father. Say, I have access, I have access. unto the Father. Yes. How many know sometimes we don't feel like our prayers are getting answered? That's your problem. You feel too much and you read too little. What do you do when you feel like your prayers aren't being heard? Quit feeling like your prayers aren't being heard. The Bible says you have access. Yeah. Ephesians 3.12, in whom we have, in whom, in Christ, we have. I have boldness and access with confidence. <laughs> I have boldness and access by faith. With confidence. Everywhere you are weak, you're leaving here strong. Everywhere you are timid, you're leaving here bold. I see a fire coming on Revival Today Church Fort Worth from heaven right now. I see a fire coming on Revival Today Church Pittsburgh today. Go ahead, clap and shout. Let the redeem of the Lord say so. Say it so the devil can hear you. I cannot be defeated. I will not give up and quit. He who began a good work in me will bring it to completion. And number four, what can I do because I'm in Christ? Now, I'm sorry. Maybe I still have a little religion in me because I didn't give you all the scriptures because I feel like we should get out at a reasonable hour. But I give you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, and then there's two more. So it'd be tw- twenty-eight scriptures that deal with who you are in Christ. And I'll use in the future. I'll do better and use more word. But, the, but and I mean it. But this this is a good start because the word. There's an old song they used to sing at Brother Hagin's meetings. The word is working mightily in you. The word. See, nobody can take this from you. You're not, you're not getting revved up off my excitement or by the worship team or the prophetic banner team. Because one day those banners go away once the service is over and the music team goes home. But if this word's in you, they can, th- they can beat your back and throw you in prison. And something will come out of your mouth that knocks every chain off of every prisoner and opens every. <laughs> I see that faith coming alive in you right now. Nobody can take it from you. For Paul said, the word of God cannot be chained. Hallelujah. This is the real strength of the New Testament church. The word, the word, the word. Say it so the devil can hear you. The word is working mightily in me. The word is working mightily in me. The grass withers. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I'm positioned where God says I'm positioned. Where, where, where are my Bible college professors today? From 21 years ago that said the day of preaching is over, that people are too busy to come hear the word. 
Where are all the Bible college professors that said you'll never make any money in the ministry? They told Brother Kofi you need to be realistic and get a job. No, we made our decision. I'm not going to believe man. I'm going to believe the word. But I noticed they're all not talking anymore. Because if you stick with the word, the word will produce what it said it will produce. Just believe it in your heart and speak it with your mouth. I know the Lord is making a way where there is no way. He's putting streams in the desert. What can you do in Christ? 2 Peter 1.3 According as his divine power hath given unto us all things. <laughs> that covers a lot of ground. Where are airplanes in the Bible? All things. It's a big umbrella, my friend. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. I'm not trying to get the things that pertain to life and godliness. I've been given all things that pertain to life. Everybody say life and godliness. Not just godliness. Yeah, you have the spiritual inheritance, but then you also have the things that pertain to life. A home for your children, food for your belly, school clothes, backpack, all the things that life requires. God said, if you'll put me first, I'll supply your every need. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know him. I won't randomly assault people. Unto all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the, no oh, how does it come? Through the knowledge of him. How do you know God? By his word. How many of you feel slightly more confident now than you did at, at nine o'clock? See, that's the word, because you know God, and you live in him, and has called us to glory and virtue. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things. That covers, I mean, why, why read any more verses? All things that pertain to life and godliness, and then I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things. There's nothing I'll face in life that the power of God that he's granted unto me as his child is not, not equal to and greater. Abound. Who'll make his power abound? Everybody say, I'm in Christ. See, when you know who your dad is, you act different. There was a, a kid that slapped, or I think he more than slapped, he hit my sister getting off the bus. I wasn't on her bus. I was in eighth grade and she was in fifth grade. So she was in elementary school, I was in uh, middle school. So we, she comes home to dinner. My dad happened to be home. He was usually out traveling. She's cut across her face and crying. My dad said, what happened? And she, she said, uh, there's a boy that hit me when I was getting off the bus. She said, my dad said, what's his name? And uh, he, she said, my dad said, do you know him? Because we, we were in the same school, just two different parts of the building. My dad said, do you know who that boy is? I said, I do. He said, make sure that's taken care of tomorrow. It's like an episode of The Sopranos. That was the happiest day of my life up until my wedding because... I never was afraid of my teachers. I was afraid of my dad. In fact, my teachers were afraid of my dad. One time, five of us got in trouble, and they said, we're calling all your parents. And then they said, Jonathan, stay behind. So I thought I was in extra trouble. The principal went, now I'm not calling your dad. <laughs> he said, I'm going to give you one more chance, because those guys are going to get the timeout chair, and you're going to get the inability to sit in any chairs. <laughs> so when my dad told me, now I'm not acting on my own. I have the backing of my father. Okay, then that kid's going to get a, a, a sound beating. So I waited for him at the bus stop after school, and I relaxed him a little bit, like the mafia does, you know. Just started talking to him about hockey and sports, and said, hey, we're walking in the same direction. Got him nice and relaxed and talking to him. And he was mid-sentence. I, I don't know what the statute of limitations are on things like that. But when it was towards the end, I had my knees on his shoulder blades, and I was older than him, so it's not like I'm tough. I just was bigger than him, like he was bigger than my sister. And I rained blows on his face till my hands hurt. Then I got up and went home to go tell my dad the good news. Amen. 
You notice I saved this illustration for Texas? Because if you told this in other states, the church would be about a third of what it was before the story. So I'm walking back home, and uh, a Camaro pulls up and fast and hits the brake, screech, and this guy gets out, which I, you know, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to know it's probably his dad. Gets out with a big mullet. I'm in eighth grade, probably weighed 115 pounds. This guy looked, looked bad, like he'd be bad. He gets out and gets right in my face, puts his fist up to my chin and goes, was that you that, hit, that did that to my son? I said, it was. He said, he said well, you're, I'm about as much bigger than you as you are him. How'd you like if I did that to you right now? And I thought, well, I, I wouldn't like that probably. It was, I don't, I'd rather not have that happen. And as, I'm, as my mind's right, he's like, I ought to do that to you right now. And like has his fist red in the face. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. At that very moment, this sounds like some made up preacher story. You, you can talk to my dad next week and he'll remember. My dad pulls up, coming home from church, from the church office. He works with my grandfather. And he drove a red Chevy Vandura van. This is 1995. And he had it custom made where it had no windows because he carried his sound equipment with him. So, you know, the only people that drive vans with no windows are like psychopaths. <laughs> so as this red van pulls up with no windows, the guy stops his thing just to see who's coming. Obviously, you're not going to hit a kid with somebody coming. And my dad pulls up real slow and parks and then gets out. And my dad, I still remember, he was wearing it like how he dresses. He had on cowboy boots. Which, no, we were in Maine. <laughs> Nobody wears cowboy boots from like Maryland North. So windowless van, cowboy boots. My dad wore a gold bracelet back then and, and a couple of gold rings. And he gets out and he had Ray-Ban sunglasses on, which are the preferred brand of hitmen. <laughs> My dad, now this is going to sound kind of gay, but I've never marveled at a man. But, uh, <laughs> God bless that guy. He got out. The sun was behind him. I was like, wait, well, this is great. And he gets out looking like that and, and goes, is there a problem? That guy, his voice completely, how'd you like if I hit you? Is there a problem? Oh, I think our children got in some kind of disagreement, you know how kids are, and he started talking about it, you know, it happens all the time, I'm going to head back home now, he got in the car, and my dad watched him go, and when he drove off and turned the corner, my dad went, was that that boy's dad, I said, yeah, he said, did you do what I told you to do, I said, I did, he went, let's go get some ice cream, <laughs> and that was one of the best days of my life, because I was commissioned to lay a beating on somebody that was smaller than me. And then I was backed by somebody who was tougher than me if there was any problems. This might be, in keeping with my four-week string of awful church analogies, this is what I'm telling you it's like to be in Christ. Because I'm not acting on my own. I have divine backup. And if the devil wants to rear his head, I don't have to defend myself. Though your enemy comes from one direction, I'll come and make him run in seven directions. I came to tell every single mother, every divorced woman, every widow, every widower, everybody that's having the worst year of your life. You're not going through the rest of this year by yourself there is a God that's going to show up on time every time and he's given you authority and power to act on his behalf so rejoice and be glad you're not fighting life's battles the battle is already won and you have the victory it's time for revival today church to start laying some beatings on the devil that's what we're going to do this week we're going to see souls saved bodies healed children delivered not by might not by power sin on your feet in Pittsburgh sin on your feet in Texas I felt that same feeling that I felt that day in eighth grade, the whole time during the COVID lockdowns and threats from the Department of Health. Except there was no red van showing up, just invisible chariots. 
Amen. If you have church, you will be arrested. All right, then let's do it. I already know you don't have the power to do it because if you could arrest me, you don't tell somebody. Now, if you continue to murder people, we will arrest you. The fact that you're giving me a chance to stop lets me know you don't have the huevos to do what it takes. I can offend people in multiple languages. No, I got, I got backup. Everybody say, I have divine backup. Say, when the enemy comes in, like a flood, the Lord puts up a standard against him. The last assault that you ever saw will be the last assault you ever see. From this day forward, you don't get attacked. You go on the attack in Jesus' name. You are anointed to destroy the works of darkness. And that's exactly what you're going to do. The devil was picking on a soft target before, but now you got the word in you. You're going to say, whose house do you think you're in? Excuse me, you must have me mistaken for someone else. I would go to another home if I were you. Or you'll be promptly thrown out. Can you say amen? amen? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Everything I preach today, Pittsburgh and Fort Worth, those of you watching on YouTube, Maybe like our sister Sandra in Vancouver. You're at your wit's end. You're carrying a load you can't bear. Everything begins with being in Christ. You are children of God through faith in Christ. You have an inheritance in Christ. You can't go backwards like they do at a lot of churches and just teach people how to have these things and they don't have Christ. Until the something changes on the inside of you, nothing ever changes on the outside. And the inside change is, you must be born again. If you're here and you've never been born again, or you once did, and maybe the weight and pressure and attack of life caused you to have space in between you and God. You know, we're pretty close to having this floor filled on the first section, and only six months in. I'm so happy. You know, pa pastors have meetings about how, how to deal with the hardships of ministry. I'm going to write a book, How to Deal with the Hardships of Pastoring. Step one, pastor the people of Revival Today Church, Fort Worth, yeah. and Revival Today Church, Pittsburgh. There's no problems. Just, just winners. Yeah. Great. You make you make you not only make the ministry easy, you make it fun. You're great people. You have greatness on you, and you have greatness on the inside of you through Jesus Christ. If you're here and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you say, Jonathan, I'm not in Christ. I'm outside of Christ. How do you know? Very easy. Has there ever been a specific time in your life where you've made a public stand to receive Jesus Christ? Come out from among them and be ye separate. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father that's in heaven. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father that's in heaven. So today, uh, March 24th, 2023, four, sorry, 2024, that'll be the day that for the rest of your life you don't have to wonder anymore. Nope. The devil comes to you at night when you're going to go to sleep. How do you know you're going to go to heaven? Glad you asked, Mr. Devil. March 24th, 2024, I came out of the crowd, made a public stand and confess Christ as my Savior, and I'm born again. The old me's dead, and a new me's alive in Christ. Some of you have never done that. I want to pray with you like I prayed with the great Canadian people. If you were in one of the outreaches this week, and you'd like to do that publicly, I, you're not like we have our church and you're like a visitor. This church, everybody's a visitor. This church has been in existence for six months. Secondly, you once did that, but you say, Jonathan, when the attacks came, I allowed sin to come in, I got discouraged, I let things in, but today I'm kicking sin out of my life. I'm telling the devil, me and you are finished. We have no further business together. I'm gonna live my life in Christ. I'm gonna turn my back on sin, that's repentance, and give my life to Jesus Christ. If you're here and you need to do that, I want you to put your hand up high right now and I'll, I'll st stand here and pray with you right now. I see you, who else? This is not joining the Protestant church or just receive Christ. Who else? I want to give my life to Jesus tonight. Put your hand up high, or today, sorry. In Jesus' name. Very quickly, 
Those that lifted a hand, come forward, and we're going to pray right now in Jesus' name. Come. This is your day. That's so nice. You guys want each other. Come on, give your Pittsburgh. You can come forward. I give it. I give the service to you, uh, Adonis, or whoever's taking it there. Anybody else before we pray? God bless you in Pittsburgh. More. That's awesome. Keep clapping. This is great. Who else? Quickly, I want to give my life to Jesus. Oh, this is great. Anyone else before? Yes, keep, keep singing. Your singing is helping. Yeah, more. This is awesome. Anybody else before we pray? All right, let's pray together. Um, Miss Huggy McGee, I, I know the face, man. No, it's fine. I know the feeling. Yeah, it's love. I love you. I'm glad you're, you're like you are. But I just want to pray. I don't want you to skip the prayer part. Lift both hands, close both eyes. Say this prayer after me. There's a real God that hears this prayer as you pray it. Say it from your heart. Heavenly Father, I've come forward today to give you my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash me in your blood. I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord and my Savior. Right now, I receive forgiveness. By the blood of Jesus, I am saved. I am cleansed. I'm absolutely free. In Jesus' name, amen. Lift your hands, let me pray for you. Every chain or rope that the devil wrapped around your life, it falls off of you now. In Jesus' name. You leave this altar, everything I preached, if it's a lie, then I quit. But it's not a lie. So you have every spiritual blessing. That blessing's manifesting in your life right now and will continue to manifest. It's coming into you right now. In Jesus' name. More, more, and more. That's it. Healed in your body. I come in there to be a total turnaround this year. 2024 will be the best year you've ever had. No more backward steps. No more one good week, three bad weeks. From glory to glory. In Jesus' name. Victory to victory. You and leave this altar. Everything I preached. In if it's a lie, then I quit. It's not a lie. So you have every spiritual blessing. That blessing's manifesting in your life right now and will continue to manifest. It's coming into you right now. In Jesus' name. More, more, and more. That's it. Healed in your body. I come in there to be a total turnaround this year. 2024 will be the best year you've ever had. No more backward steps. No more one good week, three bad weeks. United. From the rest of your life. I, I, I'm here to stay. I, got, I have a house here now. What did, what did you enjoy about today? Everything. You did. Everything. See, I would like if you stayed around because you're very encouraging. So if you'd make this your church, you don't have to go to this church to go to heaven, but um, I don't even know why I said that. <laughs> There's no second part. But I would, I would just really like to be your pastor. And then we have, we just launched our youth ministry. We just launched our young adults ministry, women's ministry. Uh, my wife comes down and preaches. If you like me, you'd love her. She's better. And then, uh, see? And then every Sunday here at 9 a.m., other than next week, we're meeting under a tent for Easter. And they, I think they already gave you the info for that. But I'd love to, I would love to be family. You know, you can't, you face things out during the week. 
And you need a place to come where there's not people that are against you, there are people for you. People that when you get a new car, they're going to clap and say, congratulations, I'm wearing to get that. You know, celebrate your victories. People that want you to make it in life, not, not are hoping you don't make it in life. That's what a, a church family is. So I would love to see you again and um, be your pastor. So if you'd plug in the church here, and then I want you, the first people you meet after you pray this prayer, I want them to be nice people. The devil might have people waiting to try to discourage you, who knows. But here's some people that are going to encourage you, and these books are from me to put something in your hand to help you live the Christian life. So just go there quickly, and those people are going to give you some books and take you right back to your seat. All right, lift your hands all over this place. I feel like it would be stupid. I was going to do it. But I think it's stupid to preach on the word and confession for a sermon and then lay hands on everybody because then it's back to me. I'm going to have you do now in the presence of God what you're going to do your whole life that's what brings the victory. And, and obviously, you know, I believe in the laying on of hands. I think I did it. I had to have done it. I don't know. 10 times in the last week up in Vancouver. I, I think this will be the first time I haven't laid hands on everybody here. Now, there's people in a crowd this size that after I get done doing this, if I don't say what I'm about to say, you'd say, now, can I have prayer? I'm sick, or I brought this person. This ministers healing. I'm not doing this to get out of touching people. I'm doing this because you need to put into practice the word that was preached today, which is knowing what you have in Christ. Not coming to get what you feel I have that you need. It's yours. Everybody say, it's mine. So whatever you need and whatever you desire from the Lord, I want you, we're gonna pl- we're go- they're going to play, um, let's switch the song up. What else you got? I trust you. We're going to play a praise song, and I want you, with your hands lifted, to say this with me, and then once we start singing, no one's going to hear you. We're going to take three or four minutes and I want you to speak to the Lord. If you came to be healed, thank him. Now you don't say, now Lord, please. Say, say this with me. Say, Father, thank you. So that I have. So change I need healing to thank you that I have healing through Jesus Christ. And then you, you tell the difference even in the example. There's a power. We're no longer beggars or slaves. Oh, I need a... Father, thank you that through the blood of Jesus Christ, I have all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, every hand lifted. As we sing this, just begin to pull down on it right now. Let's take three minutes and do it. Go ahead.
this out loud in the name of Jesus. I take every blessing that Christ provided for me. I receive now all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, I'm doing this in line with my teaching. I'm happy to pray for everybody. I'm Pentecostal, but I'm not. Because think of this, if after two hours of this message and all this, you come up and say, I need, I'm probably gonna climb to the top of this building and fling myself off. Because I told you, you don't need, you have, yeah, but I feel, I know. But watch as you speak the word, how the healing power of God that's been given to you will overwhelm it on the way to the parking lot. Say it so your own self can hear it. Say, I don't need. I have all things that pertain to life and godliness because I'm in Christ. How many of you feel the victory that releases? Now, as you line your mouth up with the Word of God, you're going to walk in physical strength, physical healing, supernatural abundance, in Jesus' name. Four years ago, about this week, the lockdown hit, and they told us, you know, it looked bad, especially if you were a ministry. Couldn't have church. I was wondering what I was going to do, and the Lord said, call all your staff in and tell them. None of, I know you've been hearing things, and churches have laid off two-thirds of their employees already and stuff. Tell them none of them will lose their jobs, and none of them will get a pay decrease. And I was thinking, easy for you to say. But all God was having me do was line my mouth up with what his word says and speak it. I bet you he didn't have me say that for the employee's benefit. I bet he had me say it for my benefit. And I, I felt the opposite. But I called him all and I said, now I know all you've been hearing things about the economy going bad and all that, and lockdown and a deadly virus. None of you are gonna lose your jobs and nobody here is getting a pay decrease, so just relax. I said, thank you. And I was thinking, yes, and I, I'm gonna try to also relax myself but you use your mouth, say what the Bible says, whether you feel it or not, because it's true whether you feel it or not. Can you say amen? Lift your right hand to heaven. Say, thank you, Father, that because of Christ, I am healed. I am blessed. I am highly favored. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't lack anything. In Jesus' name, I have no needs because all my needs have been supplied. I pull on that supply right now by faith in Jesus' mighty name. Now, from 11.46 a.m. until the Good Friday service, every hanging attack over your life, legal, otherwise, it, the victory comes into manifestation this week in Jesus' mighty name because death and life's in the power of the tongue you lose life out of your tongue. Good luck to the devil that's been assigned to keep you bound. You have the victory in Jesus' mighty name. So rejoice and be glad in Jesus' mighty name. Good Friday. Can you pop the graphic up for Good Friday? The Good Friday graphic. Friday, 7 p.m. Saturday, there's an Easter egg hunt, 11 to 2 p.m., and then service again at 7, and then the main event at 9 a.m. That's all with my father. Do not miss that Good Friday service. I, my dad is worth hearing. That's why I'm not bringing him here because he's my dad. I have lots of relatives. My dad's anointed. He preached here during the 21 days when we started the church. Most of you already know that. Millions of views on his YouTube channel on Bible prophecy. That Good Friday service will change people's lives. Endeavor to make this upcoming weekend the most spiritual weekend you've ever had. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at 9 a.m. at the new location. This is the only Sunday we're not here. North Park, 5220 Denton Highway, Haltom City, Texas, 76117. If you're watching online, you're welcome to join us. Watching on television, same thing. Thank you for the privilege of being able to pastor the happiest, easiest bunch of people this side of heaven. Have the best week you've ever had. Jesus is Lord. Give the Lord another great hand clap.